Good afternoon to one and all, and a very warm welcome to you all to this webinar. Thank you for showing interest in this topic, and we are very happy to receive this positive response from you all, that you in a very short notice. This webinar is set in a discussion mode. You can type in your question, which will be discussed at the end. As you all know, oh, yeah. As you all know, commodities play a very significant role in our life, in our everyday life. Understanding their dynamics provides a very useful key to understand the world that we live in and its future. Who can tell us the dynamics of commodity trade market than Mr. John Bugeja? Thank you, John, for accepting our invitation and we know how busy you are. So it is indeed our pleasure and we are so honored to have you here with us. Thank you very much, my pleasure. Uh, most of the attendees, John, including me, who are certified trade finance practitioners, we have learned about trade finance from the books authored by you. So for those who are versed, John has authored many books on trade finance including uh, LIBF's textbooks for CITF and supply chain financing. John is a senior transaction banking specialist with a particular focus on trade, supply chain and invoice financing. He is the managing director at Trade Advisory Network Limited. So without much ado, as we are time constrained, Let's get into the topic of today's uh, webinar, Commodity Trade Finance Guidelines for Traders and Bankers. So John, we would like to hear from you, what is Commodity Trade Finance and how does it differ from other trade finance instruments, especially the traditional ones? Yeah. Commodity trade finance actually uses traditional trade finance instruments. So in many ways, it's not it's not different, uh, but it uses them in a different context. Um, so to sort of compare and contrast a little bit, if you take a, a non-commodities transaction, that might be uh, the import uh, white T-shirts, to give you an example. Actually, that does behave quite a lot like a commodity, but it's not a commodity. Um, a bank might support an importer with import LCs and follow on finance, uh, which would cover maybe the stock holding period. And then the, as a separate but related transaction, they might uh, finance the on sale of those goods from the warehouse, uh, maybe high street sellers, probably using receivables finance. And those would be two sort of standalone uh, independent sets of transactions, but they'd be in the context of an overall end-to-end -end trade cycle. Uh, commodity, uh, again, with the non-commodity finance business, transaction sizes can be very small uh, and there can be a very high flow of business, uh, high volumes of activity, but if the transaction size is quite small. Um, normally prices are agreed in advance. In other words, the buyer and seller agree a contract or a purchase order. There is no variation in that price it's agreed up front, so the risk of price, the price changing partway through the transaction isn't normally, there are always exceptions, obviously, but there's normally something the banker is going to be too concerned about. Um, commodity finance, commodities are inherently uh, um, big ticket transactions. You don't generally buy a small tanker load of oil. A tanker load of oil is normally a, a large amount of money. I'm not sure what the oil price is at the moment, but it, it's going to run into the into the several millions of dollars for a tanker load of oil, probably around five, seven million dollars, something like maybe a little bit more. Um, but you can check the you can check the oil price at your leisure. So there's a big difference there straight away. Another big difference is that a, a commodity is is tradable in its own right, whereas white T-shirts or engine components or engineering goods generally are not tradable. There's a buyer, there's a seller, and there may be an on sale onto another party. 
but they're all contractually agreed. The specification is agreed uniquely for that transaction. Commodity, commodity are um, standardized. They are commoditized, hence the word. So they are standardized in terms of their specification. Normally, they're tradable on, a, on an exchange, uh, a term, what's known as a terminal exchange, which means there are always buyers and there are always sellers, and the price will vary uh, depending on supply and demand and other other factors which will uh, imp impact the price. So you've got a lot of differences there, but the actual transactions involve actually the same. They still involve letters of credit. Quite often they may well involve bills or bill discounting. Um, they may well involve receivables finance and payables finance or supply chain finance. And in fact, a single transaction might be multiple different all in a single structure. So what you're looking at is a big ticket sort of scenario. You're looking at a scenario where the price may not be agreed. Um, the, uh, the the price that the that your client, the trading company, is is buying the commodity at, and the price they're on selling at, they may they may vary depending on market movements. They may have hedged. They may not have hedged. If you're the bank financing that transaction. Um, then you are actually relying completely on the sale of those goods, that commodity, as your source of repayment. There isn't another source of repayment, usually. But I say you, I'll keep saying you, because there can always be exceptions to everything. Nothing is ever an absolute rule, but these are the generalities. So a bank is going to be interested in a number of things when they finance a commodity, uh, one of which is the uh, performance of the seller. Are they able to deliver the commodity? Is it to the right standard that meets the market's expectations? Uh, are they protecting themselves, is our client protecting themselves against price movements? And is the bank protected against price, price movements? What's happening to the commodity in the physical world, in the real world? How is it being transported or shipped? Um, how is it being stored? Who, has, who owns the commodity at a given point in time? Because that is the bank's source of repayment. It's the bank's security pending on sale. So it may be security for finance provided to the seller, the source of the commodity. And when the commodity is then sold by the client to the off taker, the buyer, uh, that becomes the source of repayment. All of those cash flows need to be controlled and managed and monitored. The bank needs to protect itself against uh, price fluctuations. Uh, and the price needs the bank needs to be confident that the goods themselves do exist, are of the right quality, and are under their control. Because with those goods, that commodity, whatever it is, uh, is um, it disappears. You know, it, it gets delivered to a party outside of the bank's control. That means the bank has no source of repayment. So. In many ways, very similar to traditional trade finance or, or standard trade finance, but there are these added complications. And I think if there was one golden rule, uh, and that is it's, it's not a good idea to dabble in commodities finance. Uh, you may be very, very good at uh, um, providing a range of trade finance solutions or a range of customers covering a range of products. But you really have to understand the commodity and the market. That's why it's difficult. I would never describe myself as a commodities finance expert or a specialist because you can't be an expert in all the commodities. You might be an, somebody might be an expert in grain. Somebody else might be an expert in oil. Somebody might be an expert in uh, uh, liquid petroleum gas or metals or whatever it is. They're not going to be an expert on everything. And it's actually deep expertise in the actual commodity and the way that market works. That's really important. Um, all the other all the other sort of uh, rules about knowing your customer, doing the due diligence on the transaction, they all apply as well. But the impact of getting that wrong is much greater with commodity finance because the commodity is the source of payment. There is nothing else. You don't normally have a secondary source of repayment. You might have credit insurance, which might help on the receivable, but you don't normally have fixed asset security or anything like that. You're completely dependent on the transaction for your source. Yeah. 
So in recent years, what we have seen is the commodity trade finance is gaining a lot of importance. Is it due to the fact that you know supply chain financing is now replacing the traditional trade financing methods because even the traders as well as the bankers they would like to go for either uh, receivable based financing or loan based uh, financing because of the Basel IV and you know the more restrictions that is going to be imposed on the banks even on the off balance sheet exposures. Yeah, I'm not sure it's become more popular i think it's it's gained more visibility which maybe gives the impression that it's more prevalent uh i think um commodities finance has always been with us it's always been complicated it, it's always been higher risk than other forms of trade finance because of all the reasons i've mentioned before um and in fact i would say that many banks in recent years have actually pulled out of the market so uh, because they've because they lost money, uh, and they lost money usually because of uh, fraud or poor poor controls, which enabled fraudsters or financial crime to be perpetrated. Um, so it's become more specialised, um, and I, at the moment, I would say right now there are fewer banks involved in in commodities finance than there used to be, but they are more knowledgeable and they are more um, specialized in what they do um, and they need to be because the prevalence of, of financial crime has has increased um, you will have seen the uh, you will have all seen the um, things that have happened in singapore uh, yeah we are going to discuss that in yeah. singapore. Um, singapore is not alone in that it just happens to be a major trading hub um, uh, so financial crime, I think, is the biggest issue. Credit. If you look at trade finance generally, you've got performance risk on the supplier. Generally, you've got the credit risk or the ability to pay on the buyer. Those two things go hand in hand. So if the supplier fails to perform, the buyer doesn't have an obligation to pay. So the credit, the quality of the credit risk becomes irrelevant if the supplier fails to perform. If the, if the supplier performs correctly, then you're reliant on the credit quality of the buyer. Now, those things apply to all forms of trade finance, but with the size of the transactions and the and the relatively high gearing, the, 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 yeah, the, a lot of companies involved in commodities finance are actually not that big um, in themselves. Traders, uh, particularly the intermediary between the original producer and the off taker that's actually turning that commodity into something else, they're normally quite big companies. The producer may or may not be a big company. It may be a farm, you know, producing grain with no resources at all, no actual finance. Or it may be a major, major sort of oil multinational. But the parties in the middle who are traders, they often have very, very limited resources of their own. So if they don't perform their role correctly or something happens either side of them, they don't have anything to fall back on. So that's that's why the bank is dependent on transaction control, security in the goods, and controlling the goods and controlling the cash flows. So a lot of banks have dealt with traders without necessarily fully protecting themselves against the risk that the trader ceases to be viable uh, and then gets involved in financial crime. Financial crime is very interesting. If I, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't want to dive, take us down too far down the financial crime alley, but it's very closely associated with commodities trade finance. And if you want to do commodities trade finance successfully, the yeah the thing that I would really say you need to protect yourself against is financial crime. Credit risk analysis, performance risk analysis are things which you have to do for any transaction. But financial crime is so so difficult to manage with big ticket transactions involving multiple parties. Goods can change hands multiple times during a single end-to-end -end, uh, cycle. So financial crime is really important, uh, and it can for it can take a number of forms. I mean, it could be that a part parties collaborating together uh, oh. to defraud or. Yeah, or another party and the bank happens to happens to be a, an innocent bystander during that process. Or it could be financial crime, to, to uh, which is money laundering, 
based in order to fund uh, illegal trade, armaments, uh, drugs, uh, you know, whatever the illegal trade is. The uh, financial crime can be used to launder the money to make it look clean so that they can uh, use that money to, to do things which are illegal. Now, the banks have a huge responsibility to, to spot that. Um, they're not the police, but they're sort of treated by the regular almost as if they are the police for the world trading community. Yeah. When you're in a bank, that, that can feel quite challenging. Um, but commodities finance, if you're going to if you're going to perpetrate a big a financial crime, that's quite a a good place to start if you're if you're a criminal because the numbers are so big. Um, and these things have a pattern, you know. Where we can maybe talk about that a little bit. A little bit later on, when we think about you know, what's attractive about the industry, what's challenging, and how do you how do you manage uh, your involvement in it in a secure and safe way? And one of the reasons that this is interesting for me is that uh, uh, my I get involved in commodities trade finance generally when it's gone wrong, not when it's going well. It's actually a long time ago that when I was working in one of the big banks that I was involved in in transacting commodity finance. Since uh, starting Trade Advisory Network um, seven or eight years ago, my involvement in commodities because we don't do commodities finance in Trade Advisory Network. You know, we're a consulting business uh, and an education provider, and so. Yeah. On. Uh, but what one of the other things we do is expert witness work, uh, and uh, I can't talk about specific cases, but I mentioned Singapore. That gives you a rough idea of the, of the sort of cases that I've been involved in, and they are commodities related. So I, what I tend to see is what happens when it's gone wrong and it's gone to court or it's gone to arbitration, and then and then the, there are two parties who have who are battling. Yeah, there's going to be a loss. Somebody somewhere is going to lose a large amount of money, uh, and it's a question of who is going to lose the money and why did it go wrong and what safeguards were missed or what red flags were missed. And that's, I think, that's where commodities finance can be interesting. You learn more when things go long, wrong than simply observing things going right. Um, so that, I think that's quite an interesting angle. Yeah, in your discussion also, uh, John, you were referring to big banks. So uh, commodity trade financing, is that an option for small banks or it is uh, suitable to the portfolio of global banks only? Um, I think I think it's a small bank can successfully. They will need they will need they can be a small bank, but they will need deep pockets. Um, a small bank with a small balance sheet and limited access to funding. Will probably struggle. Um, what's important is that they have the expertise. So that means having a team that actually has that. In, in order to break into the commodities world, uh, it would be very difficult for for a, 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 a small bank that's got no history in that. They probably the best way to break into it would probably be by buying another bank, or buying a specialist, or by or recruiting a whole team, and setting up from scratch. But they expect to be shown some very strange and dodgy transactions that the existing banks that are active in those markets have turned down. They're not going to get the good transactions, uh, certainly not to start with. So it's difficult to break in if you're not used to, if you're not already doing it. You don't necessarily have to be global as a bank, and a lot of global banks don't really do commodity finance anymore. They're pulled out out of the market. Uh, because they couldn't make money or because they incurred some losses as a result of fraud or financial crime generally. Um, so you don't necessarily need to be global, but you do need to be on the ground in the markets in which you're active. So you don't need to be everywhere, but you need to be visible and on the ground. Otherwise, you're going to struggle to have control over the, uh, the products and goods. Uh, you're going to struggle with... Uh, executing local receivables arrangements or executing local practices and just being aware of how a particular market works. Uh, it would be very difficult to to trade in commodities involving, let's say, uh, uh, Singapore and India. That's a good good example. There's a lot of stuff goes between Singapore. If you don't have a presence in Singapore or India, uh, no, you, you, you could operate with a correspondent and that's fine, mm -hmm. but uh, if something goes wrong, you you will struggle to uh, 
to extricate yourself from the bank now incurring a loss. So I would say it's not the size so much as the physical footprint and the presence, and most importantly of all, the expertise and the and the and the precedent, the history. As I say, even if you've got the best team in the world and you're starting from scratch, you'll probably be shown transactions that the other banks have declined. Um, and you, you, that's like almost like a rite of passage. You, you'll have to go through that process before you start seeing transactions which are actually interesting and you want to do. Um, so, and you have to be a little patient to get, get some traction there. And you have to accept that there will be loss to start with. I mean, the, the, the things will not always go perfectly. A bank expects to make a lot occasionally on transactions. Uh, and, and if you haven't got a history of transactions, that first loss could be a big hit. If you've done a, a million transactions and then you take a hit, you sort of expect that. Uh, it's part is the cost of doing business. But when you're new in a market, that can be a real challenge for your investors and your shareholders and your depositors and your regulator. Oh, yeah, that's that's very true. <laughs> the regulator is the uh, now you know in the trade financing like um, the recently the survey conducted by ICC even shows that for the trade financing the the biggest impediment is the AML uh, regulations. That's what the <laughs> trade finance practitioners are looking. I think I think they can certainly appear that way. I think if you have really good practice in terms of due diligence. Um, then it's still it's still onerous. So, but but if you've invested in the systems and the practices and can generate scale, then you can still make money. I think the problems arise when you you, you have to invest in the the systems to to manage the due diligence, but you don't have the scale, uh, and then the, the 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 work and the cost involved looks prohibitively high. Uh, that's why it's quite a high barrier to entry, I think, for that reason. Um, it, it, when you, you only really test these things when they've gone wrong. I mean, uh, so there is best practice. There are lots of reg there is lots of uh, guidelines as to how you should progress. For example, I take an example. Um, let's say I, I'm I'm financing a shipment of metals uh, from. Uh, yeah, the, the source of my customer is a is a trader. Uh, they're, they're, they're buying from a, a producer or possibly another trader. And then they're on selling to an off taker who may be another trader or maybe an end user that's going to turn those metals into something else. They may be the end of the commodity chain. Um, and, and they show me some shipping documents to say, right, the goods are loaded on board the vessel. Can you now? lend me some money so I can pay the suppliers um, uh, in anticipation of getting paid by my by my buyers. Um, so I'm now sitting on a bill of lading or a set of bills of lading. And uh, do do I know they're genuine? They're bits of paper. We could talk about digitalization in a second. I think that's a really, really interesting area. But traditionally I'm looking at probably three pieces of paper. Um, and I'm Looking at these, thinking, well, are they genuine? Were they issued by a carrier? Or straight forward? Are they real? Um, does the vessel exist? Are, are, the, are those goods, that commodity, is it actually on the vessel? Does this document actually give me title, or is it is it fake? Um, is there another set of documents where somebody else thinks they've got title and they get there before me? All of those questions go you need to be addressed. So one of the ways you do that is you check whether the vessel actually exists and is en route from where it says it's starting from and to where its its destination is. And and you can check that the registers, the International Maritime Bureau, the Lloyd's List, all these online online registers, and you can check those things. Does that mean that that document is genuine? No, it doesn't. It just means the vessel exists. So somebody could create a fake copy of a bill of lading, which relates to a genuine shipment. Oh. That will not highlight whether that shipment is genuine or not. All it will tell you is the vessel exists and is on route. It's actually incredibly difficult to check whether the goods that you are financing actually exist and are on board the vessel. Uh, so some of that falls back on 
your due diligence, your know your customer due diligence, knowing the counterparties and undertaking that level of due diligence before the transactions start. Because you can't always tell with the transactions. Um, and I've certainly seen I've certainly seen cases where the documentation looked perfectly genuine. The vessel did exist, uh, but actually it was fake. Uh, and they just find a vessel on the journey and they mock up a, a fake bill of lading. And uh, it, it seems to pass all the checks. But in reality, it's, it's a fraudulent transaction. Um, uh, and you can have collusion then between parties, so um, which can build up a track record which looks like success. It looks like successful trading performance where you're handling actually fake documents, but you're not aware of it. And the cash is going, is, is passing between the parties. It's, it's circulating nicely, probably back and backwards and forwards. And it looks like everything works. So you build up a nice track record until the big transaction or series of transactions take place. And then the source of refund exists because the parties have now disappeared. Um, now, sorry, I hope, I'm not trying to frighten everyone into not getting involved in commodity trade finance. Guess what I'm what I'm trying to do is you need to be aware of who you're dealing with and you need to be very, very, very intimately familiar with the dynamics of the specific commodity that you're financing, because that's the only way that you have a chance of spotting something which doesn't quite ring true. So if you would expect with certain commodities to have an inspection certificate, for example, um, if a transaction is being progressed and there's no inspection, well, that, that would raise a question. Uh, why would a buyer commit to pay for something if they will need an inspection certificate, maybe to clear the goods through customs, and there isn't one in the documentation that's being processed? There may be a perfectly satisfactory explanation but it's a question that needs to be raised. If you don't understand your commodity that you're financing, you won't know whether something is normal or unusual, whether it's an exception or in the normal course of business. So all of those things mean you have to really understand the commodity you're in. Uh, there isn't, the, I, I would say there's no such thing as commodities finance as a sort of generic practice to, to become an expert in. You become an expert in commodities that you are financing and, exactly. and that's really important. Exactly, because normally what I have seen in the past is whenever letters of indemnities are used as a part of commodity trade financing, uh, there has been a lot of chances for fraud. So, um, see, as an, what excites you most as the uh, commodity um, trade finance specialist or what advice you would like to give it to someone, especially in this part of the world, we are very keen to uh, know more about commodity trade finance. You know, we are in a very um, big situation. Well, I think education is key. Um, you know, learn as much as you can about uh, how how particular commodities work, uh, and and it's important to learn about physical supply chain. Um, yeah. know, I, think, I think we're all bankers on this call, ex banker in, in my case, um, and it, it's easy to fall into the trap of believing that the banker's role is the most important role. Everything revolves around the bank when you're financing trade generally, not just commodities. Uh, and the reality is that that's not true. The world does not revolve around the banks because the most important parties are the buyer and the seller. And what, what's most important to them is executing the transaction. So sourcing goods, making sure they're the right goods, making sure they're shipped, making sure they arrive, making sure they're to the right and they arrive on time, making sure they're paid for. And then making sure you don't run out of money. But if, if so, from a banker's point of view, if you're looking to learn about commodities. Let's learn about the physical side first. Learn about how it works. How does oil get traded? How does grain get? How do the markets? How does the exchange work? What are the hedging opportunities? Um, what's the history of you know, price volatility? And really understand. You don't necessarily need to be an expert customs clearance processes for each commodity. But you need to know enough to say that, uh, to be able to determine 
what were, what's right and what's wrong, you know, just at a high level about your commodity. So some of the um, uh, some of the commodity finance, some of the more bespoke or exotic things like the the cocoa bod uh, programs from where was that? Uh, was that Ghana? I can't remember now. Ghana. It was Ghana, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, it's a long time ago since I got involved in that. A long, long time. Um, but yeah, what's the impact of weather on that? You're financing something which literally doesn't exist. It's 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 plant being planted. It's being farmed. And eventually it will be harvested. And when it's harvested, that's your that commodity then can be sold and is your source of repayment. So what about the weather? How does that work? How, yeah, what about plague? You know, what about diseases you might have? all of those things? Uh, I mean you, you need to understand them and then you can decide whether the risk is acceptable and then think about the financing. Always start with the physical supply chain. We advocate that in all the work we do, both educational work but also with um with banks, fintechs, and with whenever we're we're looking at um, uh, the way they trade, we always say, "Well, forget the banking to start with." You know, anyone that in the first meeting starts talking letters of credit, kick them out the door. You know, send them home and say, "No, that's not that's not the place to start." The place to start is where do you source? How do you source? Uh, what are the performance risks? How do the goods move? Are they perishable? Are they valuable? Do they need to be insured? You know, do they need to be stored in particular conditions? Who controls the story, etc. All the way through to how do I get? How do, how do you get paid? How do you how do you ensure that the goods get delivered to the right party? That party has the ability to pay, has the legal obligation to pay, and how do you then control the cash so that? When, it, when they do pay, we, the bank that's lent all the money, actually get, get our share. Get, we get paid first. Start with, the, start with the physical, then look at the financial. And then, and I think this brings us to the most exciting bit of the most exciting development, or potential development in the world of commodities finance, I think is and will be for the years to come, the digital, digitalization of trade. It could have a massive impact on commodities finance. And what that I've talked about the physical supply chain, the financial supply chain, then there's the information supply chain. So that's the data that gets created. And the traditional world of commodity finance, that data is paper. So you have your invoice, you have your purchase order, you have your marine insurance, you have your inspection documents. You have your packing list and most importantly, you have your documents of title, your transit documents, which are usually documents of title. They're all bits of paper. Bits of paper are incredibly useful in many ways. They suffer from huge deficiencies, but let's not forget. I can create a piece of paper and give it to you and you can read it. You don't need a special machine. You don't need to buy a license. I just need to give that paper to you and you can immediately read it. The, so it's a great standard because it's, it's available, it's accessible to absolutely everyone. Now, with, docu with negotiable instruments, yeah. um, bill of exchange, bill, draft. bill of exchange, prominent, with the negotiable payment instruments, negotiable documents of title, transport documents, bills of lading in the main, um, physical possession is really important. Because, we, because your right to get paid, if it's a bill of exchange, or your right to take possession of the goods, it arises because you hold the document. So paper is great for all those reasons. Unfortunately, paper is terrible every other way. It's very easily easy to fake. Your average eight-year-old, just with standard Microsoft Word you know, on their computer, can probably produce uh, a, a bill of lading which looks like a bill of lading. It's exactly. not difficult. Uh, and it would say, even if it's a trade, would probably look at it and say, yeah, that looks like a bill of lading. Uh, bills of exchange, very easy to produce. How do you know that they're genuine? So, getting away from paper, but, but commodities is still heavily paper based. Then you've got the, the, uh, <coughs> the environmental impact of all that paper before we start thinking about the alternative I mean, all that paper has to be printed it, it's then stored 
if, the, if we're talking about documents, title, negotiable instruments, it has to be secured, stored in a secured way. Because if you lose it, you've lost the value. You're no longer entitled to, to those rights if you've lost the original. It has to be shipped. So you, I said earlier, I could write a piece of paper and give it to you. Well, I can't because you're sitting in Bahrain. Uh, but I, I would give it to a courier. Uh, they would fly it along with all the other bits of paper to you, incurring uh, air miles, you know, all, the, all the fuel costs and the, the pollution uh, as a result. And, and then we delivered the last mile. It would be delivered by road to you and then you might sign it and send it back to me i mean it's incredibly environmentally unfriendly it's incredibly difficult it, we're, we're, we've all lived through the, the pandemic it's still there it hasn't gone away no, it is. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, most people have been affected by it most businesses have been affected so during lockdown everyone worked from home handling bits of paper is incredibly difficult if you're not in an office um, because the bits of paper arrive in an office in a big package, and commodities finance involves a lot of bits of paper. So how do you, so all these things cause delays? Now that has all encouraged the move towards digitalization, and this is the most interesting and exciting development affecting trade generally. But the impact on commodities trade finance will potentially be huge, um, and there's a number of reasons for this. Let's just talk about fraud again, my favourite subject, when it all goes horribly wrong, financial crime, fraud. Is, is, is a digital solution more or less likely to be acceptable for fraud than paper? And I would suggest it's a lot less susceptible to fraud. It can't prevent fraud 100%, but people worry about the digital solution. Well, what about fraud? What about being hacked? It's a lot harder to do that than it is to fraudulently create a piece of paper. Uh, obviously, there are some issues with digital equivalents to documents. Um, yeah, can I produce a digital bill of lading and say that's a bill of lading? If, if it's just a digital, I can do it now. I've got my, my, my desktop here, just here in front of me. I could create a bill of lading. I could send you a file and say that's a bill of lading. Well, it's not a bill of lading because you can't possess it. It's just a file. I could send that same file to 100 people and they've all got the identical file. The concept of an original versus a copy in, in electronic records generally doesn't exist. Now, of course, there is a solution and Bahrain uh, already has a legal framework to allow that solution, which is the um, uh, Melita, yeah, Model on Electronic Transfer of Records. You are one of the first. Singapore is, is, has got it as well. The UK, the UK is, has got legislation through Parliament right now which will, which will allow for electronic trade. So there are two, so that brings up two solutions. The traditional, the, old, the slightly dated version of digitization is closed user groups. So you have a club, if you like, and you create a title registry and you you create an electronic bill of lading, maybe an electronic bill of exchange. They're not really bills of lading and they're not really bills of exchange, but they are evidence that the goods are in transit and they're evidence of who currently has a title and they're evidence that that title can be transferred from one party to another. The downside with that, and these two systems work, they exist today, they've existed for many, many years. The downside is they only work amongst parties who have signed up for that particular club? It's like joining a. It's like joining a gym. You know, uh, if you're in the gym but I'm not in the gym, I can't. I can't go and swim there, but you can. Yeah, and it's the same. It's the same problem. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, if if you're if you're using Bolero, for example, or Estox or Wave, and I'm not, I can't. I can't be a party to that transaction because I can't be registered as an owner. A good exactly. unless I'm a member of the club. Similarly, with a you all you're all familiar with you know uh, the some of the consortia, some of the payment and trade platforms yeah. like uh, Marco Polo, uh, Contour, Congo. Um, they all work and they're all effective, but they only work within a closed community. So if you look at a a typical trade cycle for a a commodity or in the commodities world. There are multiple parties 
if you're going to use, let's say, Comjo to manage your letters of credit, then every party in that chain will need to subscribe to Comgo. Otherwise, it will have to revert to paper. And then all the problems with paper come back to the surface. So these, I call them closed user groups or membership-based systems. And they're all subject to contract. Uh, okay. So they sign a rule book. And the rule book is basically a contract. And that contract says, if you take a bill of uh, a payment instrument, for example, if we both signed a contract that says that digital record or that entry on the blockchain, and we can talk some more about blockchain, interesting stuff, that entry on the blockchain that says, I owe you the money, if we both agree contractually that that means that I do in fact owe you the money, then under contract law, you can sue me under the contract if I don't pay you. Exactly. But if you transferred that payment obligation to another party that hasn't signed that contract, then I don't owe, I don't owe them money because they haven't signed the contract, so they can't sue me if I don't pay them. So everyone's got to join the club. Now, we know that in practice, no, we're not going to have a situation where there's only ever going to be one club and everyone joins that one club. There are going to be multiple clubs, multiple platforms, and no one is going to want to join all of them. So you have an interoperability problem. Now, the ICC are doing a lot of work on inter interoperability, but the alternative approach which already will already work legally in Bahrain, so you're actually ahead of the game here, is to say, well, let's not have a club a membership-based system or a closed ecosystem. Let's have an open ecosystem approach whereby we actually look at the benefits of the possession of a document, but we make that document digital, but we use the appropriate technology to establish the principles of in independent control. You know, so one party has an original, everyone else doesn't have an original. You can transfer the original from one party another in exactly the same way as you can with paper also all consistent with Melita model law and electronic transferable records um, and beyond the benefits of paper you can also verify the authenticity of what's in that document so you can verify that what you're looking at is the latest version there may be earlier versions you're looking at the latest what you're looking at has not been tampered with and it, and it is the definitive version. Now, you can't do that with paper at all, but you can do that if you have the right technology. Now, right, the technology does exist. Um, there are there are a couple of um, versions of the technology. They have a different sort of approach, but they do exist, and they're sort of based on blockchain. So let's let, let me let's talk about block blockchain. What are the advantages and disadvantages? Blockchain caused a huge amount of hype several years ago when it first gained some prominence I mean, it, it was well known for bitcoin uh years and years ago probably for the wrong reasons but blockchain forget bitcoin forget cryptocurrency for now just think about blockchain as a a way of recording something that everyone can share and see and it's immutable uh, it can't be changed it can't be tinkered um you could, and a lot of these uh, these closed ecosystems like Hongo and Marco Polo, that's how they use blockchain. The data as to the, the, the nature of the transaction, who owns, who, who is entitled to what, uh, who is due to get paid, who has an obligation to pay, all of that is recorded on the distributed ledger. So the first problem you've got then is, well, do you want everyone to see that? Because the principles of distributed ledger technology are that it's accessible yeah. it's open. so the answer is no we don't no we definitely don't want everyone to see our, com our sensitive commercial information so let's make it a permissioned blockchain and that brings you back to the problem of a closed ecosystem only people that have permission can use that blockchain okay. um, second problem with a blockchain is where's the data uh, where does it sit? In which in which jurisdiction is the data actually placed? Are you, as a company, as a as a bank, or as a trading company working with a bank, are you happy for your business data to be held on a blockchain in a distributed ledger somewhere in the world? Uh, and in many countries, the answer will be you're not allowed to do that anyway. I'm not sure in Bahrain whether that would even be legal. It may be, it may not be. I don't know. Uh, but in some countries, it would be legal to hold your data outside yeah. of the jurisdiction 
the country where you're registered uh, for data protection reasons and all the rest of it. So you have another problem. Now, going back to benefits of Melita, um, and I'd be interested actually in getting some views from the, 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 uh, the attendees as to uh, what's actually happening in, in, in Bahrain uh, with regard to using, making use and taking advantage of this law, which you already have in place. You're one of about five or six countries which has this in place today. So using the technology, you can look after your own data in your own, on your own server. It, your, the, the electronic record with your business data does not need to be shared with anyone. Uh, what is shared on a public blockchain is, and I'm not a technology expert, so there'll be people in the, in, on, amongst the attendees who will understand this much more better, much more, much more fully than I do. But bear with me, I've been working with the technology people for a while now, so I've learned some of the language. But you could hash the information uh, uh, that's contained in your electronic record so that it's the, it's just the hash, it's just the evidence of the record, which is on the public blockchain. So for somebody else, nobody can look at that, that information on the blockchain and recreate your record. But if they've got a file, a, a copy of the record, they can show the record to the blockchain oh. and, and, and the blockchain will then say, yes, that is original. You, you you are the owner or you're not the owner and it hasn't been tampered with and it is the latest version or it's not original it's not the it's not the latest version it has been tampered with so so because it's a public blockchain that means you don't have to be a member of anything in order to verify that what you've got in your possession on your computer on your server is in fact uh, the definitive original document. So whatever rights that you have as holder, you have them because you can verify against the blockchain. And if, if there were to be a dispute, a judge or a tribunal or an arbitration can also do that. They say, well, you say you've got the original bill of exchange, you are due to get paid. You, the bill of exchange was dishonored, you weren't paid. Uh, let's just check whether you are doing fact you are the true owner, the holder of the bill of exchange, and you have got the original, and it hasn't been tampered with. Check on the blockchain. Yes, you are. Yeah. And that's that, that it's it's relatively simple. There are two technologies. There will be more that will come up, but there are two sort of approaches to this. One is one is in Singapore, uh, which is called Trade, which is effectively sponsored by the Singapore government, um, uh, and and that works pretty well. I'm not sure there are any users or many users yet. And one of the disadvantages of their 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 approach is that you can't write on the document, and it, therefore it's no longer like paper. If I gave you a piece of paper, you can write on it. Yeah, you own it. You own the original piece of paper. You want to write your shopping list on it? You can do that. It, I wouldn't recommend it, but if you wanted to do that, you could do that. But the obvious case for writing on it is when you endorse it. So if you endorse it, somebody else will pass it on. Now, the other solution is Swedish. Um, it's All of these things are available globally. They're not unique to their markets, but the originator, the creator of the software is based in Sweden. There's a company called Enigio, and their product is called Trace Original. And theirs actually follows the concept of paper much, much more closely. Uh, so you can write on a document. You can't edit anything that's gone before but you can add it, add, add content, and then re-save it. So that becomes the current latest original. And I can, anyone can transfer that document. The only person that needs a license is the person that creates the document in the first place. And that's exactly the same as I, mean, I can't create a Word document unless I've got a license with Microsoft. I can't create a PDF unless I've got a license with Adobe. Well, it's the same principle. If you have a license for Trace Original, you can create an original digital document. If I, if I can do that, I can send it to you. You can verify it through blockchain. All you need is internet access and a, a, a browser. And that's all, literally all you need. And you can now verify it. You can now own it. it do, you do not need to have a license to do that. You can now deal with it as if it were paper. Transfer it to someone else, add to it, whatever. So that, to me, that's the that's the ideal solution. Now, what that will do eventually for commodities trade finance 
is it will eliminate the need for letters of indemnity for a start because a letter of indemnity is a great way of um, perpetrating a fraud. It's a relatively easy way. Or oh, haven't got the bills, original bills are made in, they're, they're in transit. Never mind, have this letter of indemnity and give me the goods anyway, uh, or finance the goods against this letter of indemnity. Well, if a bill of lading were to be wholly digital and wholly transferable in the true sense, in the same way the thing, like negotiating. And fully negotiable. You don't need an LOI, so you don't need that problem because of, because uh, you can verify that it hasn't been tinkered, uh, tampered with. You know that it's it is in its its correct state. Questions that then arise is who's issued it? Is it orig Is it genuine? Um, so so then you have to use the electronic signature technology, which already exists. Again. You know, these things are not new. They already exist. So using electronic signatures, electronic uh, identification protocols, um, you can verify that this document was, in fact, issued by a carrier. It is genuine and it hasn't been amended, fraudulently amended. It is the original. The goods do, in fact, on that vessel because that's what the carrier said. Of course, the carrier could be committing a fraud. Yeah, so it does, exactly. it does not eliminate completely 100% the risk of fraud ever happening because if a carrier decides to commit a fraud, then obviously their paperwork, their digital documents will look original because they are original. It's just that they're colluding with a, with a trade. Obviously, they could do that today in paper form very, very easily. Uh, but at least you protect yourself against the risk that a, a fraudulent third party creates something that looks like a bill of lading but actually is a fraudulent document. If you follow the right protocols in terms of identification and signature and uh, original document technology like Trace Original or Trade Trust, then you know what you've got on your file is in fact an original bill of lading issued by the right party and, and you are the holder and therefore you have title to the goods. And that's your source of repayment. So everyone can now relax and be happy and get into commodities of course life isn't that quite that simple because but, but no longer banks can say that we deal with only documents they need yeah. to know the uh, three lines like you know, the supply chains the physical financial and the information supply chain and they must be aware of how this work then only they can get in yeah, yeah. The, the banks aren't necessarily in charge of this process. It'd be nice to think that the banks were making the decisions, but they're not. Uh, in in terms of yeah. bills of lading, it's the carriers, it's the it's the transport industry that actually will decide whether they want to embrace the technology and make use of the um, the legal changes that are happening all, all over the world. Actually, the the big one will be the UK. Because so much, so many trade transactions are subject to UK law. The Commonwealth countries basically have a version of UK law. It's very similar. Where the law changes in the UK, so it'll be the Bills of Exchange Act and the Carriage of Goods. I think it's the Carriage of Goods by Sea Act. When when those change, if they will do every year, then the Commonwealth countries generally will. They will that applies to us as well. They'll, they'll pass similar legislation. The EU is passing similar legislation. North America is, is doing likewise. Um, yeah, Singapore, Bahrain, Abu Dhabi have already passed it. Uh, there's, quite, there's a couple of other countries. Yeah, now yeah. Well. but currently we don't have any specific rules to govern uh, the commodity trade financing, right? There's no rules as such. I mean, because because commodity trade finance uses uh, standard trade instruments. There are rules for the standard trade instruments. So there's UCP 600. Um, uh, there's uh, uniform rules for demand guarantees. Um, there are there are rules even for forfeiting. Uh, so for the bill discounting, there are new yeah. rules that just come out for digital trade transactions. Digital trade. Trade transactions. Um, there are guidelines uh, which the ICC publish, which are practical guidelines, uh, which are concerned with you know, what what constitutes best practice when it comes to doing due diligence. Uh, 
at a, a onboarding level um, and also at a transaction level. So what do you need to know about your client, uh, which is basically what you need to know everything about your client. But what do you need to know about your client's buyers? Uh, what do you need to know about your client's buyers, your client's customers? That's Because that, they are the source of repay. And in order to validate from a, um, a regular, not regulation, but protect yourself against financial crime, you need as a bank to understand the end to end cycle, not just the bit that you're doing. You might only be financing the receivable. Um, yeah. For example. Um, does that mean you don't need to know where your client sources the product from? No, it doesn't mean that. You do need to understand that. And there are ICC guidelines. On all of those, on all of those things, so uh, it'd be good. Yeah, it, it would be a good idea to investigate the ICC website and just look at the papers they produce because there's a lot of good material there. Um, also worth looking at the ITFA, International Trade and Forfeiting Association website. There's a lot of good white papers there, uh, which uh, which which provide some good guidance. Um, on the ICC website, their arbitration arm because they do two things they do rules and they do arbitration uh, on the arbitration side you'll you'll find historic cases um and they're they're quite interesting as well because again you learn more when things go wrong um yeah. see nowadays banks are increasingly becoming risk covers and environmental social governments considerations are also increasingly guiding their act activities this is on one side, and on the other side, there is rising geopolitical risk and a series of recent scandals that has happened uh, with the commodity producers and traders. So no discussion on commodity trade finance is complete without talking about the collapse of Indium trading company in Singapore. Yes. The brutal uh, operations done by the owner uh, himself, uh, uh, which has uh, shocked the many of the banks uh, who have financed uh, him young uh, trading company. Yeah, so, yeah. uh, what do you think? Do banks remain committed to uh, commodity trade financing? I think I think the number of banks that are committed to, committed to commodity trade financing has gone down. Uh, there are fewer banks now that are that want to finance commodities because because of all the reasons you've mentioned. Um, uh, those that do uh, need to be extra diligent and, and have levels of expertise which are you know, seriously high in order to protect themselves against um, financial crime. Um, I mean, trade. I suppose there are two categories of crime type tr trader situations. One is a, tr a trader sets out on day one to, to basically perpetrate some financial crime and they'll create an environment which makes them makes them look legitimate and then they'll they'll pounce. Yeah, that's one model. The, the Hin Young model isn't really that. They, they were, uh, I'm sure they started off with the intention of being genuine honest law abiding traders yeah and not, and not a contradiction in in terms um, and the t the tendency to edge a little bit towards the you know, the the, um, the 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 illegal uh, to it starts when things are either they become more greedy or they encounter some trading difficulties and they need to maintain <laughs> So it, it often starts with small exaggeration, just a little bit. So maybe they'll issue the invoices a little bit earlier than, the, than they should do in order to generate the cash flow sooner. And, and gradually that will grow. Uh, and then before you know where you are, they're fraudulently producing shipping companies. <laughs> Goods don't exist, the contracts don't exist. Uh, but, they, but they have to keep issuing more invoices uh, and get more and more finance just to keep the circular movement of cash going because it's because it's like musical chairs you know when the music stops and there's nowhere to sit everyone falls over um, it, that's sort of what happens so but if you keep doing more business uh, you can keep that going for a while 
until it all stops and then it becomes clear that this is complete fabrication. So we've had the situation in, in Singapore, uh, in the UK, and actually it wasn't specifically the UK, but it, it was because it was an Australian uh, owner. But you had the um, the Greensill situation, which was not commodity. It wasn't specifically commodities related, although they did do some commodities. Uh, but they were they turned a, a relatively simple supply chain finance scenario into a into an anticipated they were they were financing anticipated sales that hadn't even been agreed yet and in some cases they were financing sales between parties that hadn't even met each other but the investors <laughs> didn't know that um, now did they start off doing that no they didn't they started off doing approved payables. Uh, and genuine receivables, but gradually they shifted. So it has become uh, more difficult, uh, and the banks have become more selective, and some banks are simply withdrawn. Uh, you've got other other scenarios. Obviously, the, uh, uh, the energy prices have, have, have gone sky high now. Well, that affects the shipment of commodities, uh, that affects the prices. Uh, you've got uh, the, the, the war in um, in Ukraine, which has created a blockade on um, grain uh, exports. I think it's wheat uh, mainly from Ukraine, but it actually accounted for quite a large percentage of the global supply of Ukraine. That's caused a shortage, which has pushed prices prices up elsewhere. <laughs> um, yeah, all of those things. Then the th you mentioned ESG, you know environmental, social and governance concerns. The governance that we talked about quite a lot. It's social, people sometimes don't talk about, but um, it, this, this impacts all forms of trade, but you know, commodities is, is included in that. So uh, what about the, the uh, health and safety issues? Um, yeah, people at the end of the chain when they're buying their finished goods, they're increasingly interested to or they want to know for sure that the goods they're buying aren't the result of uh, modern slavery you know uh, and then they're, they're not the result of uh, health and safety abuse um, or child labor you know all of those things and buyers and so you have to go back through the entire chain so we might be looking at a consumer product at the end but it, everything ultimately starts with a commodity something comes out the ground uh, which starts that cycle and in order to satisfy the ESG requirements you have to effectively be able to check the provenance of the entire supply chain right to the word go so whether it's coffee you know other the conditions in which the coffee is grown the way the farmers are treated by their uh, off takers um, all of those things become relevant. So uh, now banks, they're not, again, they're not the police for this process, but they're the ones that handle the payment flows. They're the ones that handle the document flows, usually, or the digital document flows. So the onus is on them to, to, to be visible and to monitor um, what's going on in terms of ESG and there are all sorts of new processes which are being introduced whereby a supply chain can be certified it's not perfect yet it's a long way to go but um, yeah that all of that adds cost process exactly. it is necessary um, and and there will be increasing demands for ESG compliance now the plus side to that is ESG compliance actually goes hand in hand with fighting financial crime. Because if you've got that provenance and that visibility, especially if it's digital, all of these things do actually connect to each other. But if you can, if you can manage your ESG processes correctly, you will, by definition, have sorted out your provenance, you will have sorted out your digitization, and you will be fighting financial crime. So ultimately, it will become a benefit to all parties. Um, and, uh, and that's where the banks are, they are commodity trade finance. That's where they're spending some time now focusing on that. Um, it's taken a few years to get to that point, but I think we are at that point now where the banks are actually taking it seriously. Um, 
but there's quite a long way to go before the certification process is, is all embracing and reliable and automated. It's still quite, um, um, I wouldn't say superficial, but if, if anything that require that is works on the basis of self certification is open to abuse. So you sort of need to avoid so, self certification. So surveys, uh, which is a lot of the ESG practices are based on surveys now. It's to start, but it's not ideal. Uh, so you need to get beyond that. Uh, and that's the way the industry, I think. Very true, very true. So the risk-based due diligence is something uh, the banks should be following to each customer. It's, it's, it's not stops with KYC, it's KYCC, CDD, that too risk-based. That's what banks should be following with the knowledge of the supply chains, the entire chains, they must uh, be aware of. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and that's, so, what makes, that's what makes the job interesting as well, because you're not just yeah, very true. Very with true. numbers on a screen or bits of paper. You're dealing with real life transactions, real goods uh, coming from real places produced by real companies, real people, moving across the world, you know, going, out, going, going to buyers. And part of the environmental is, is the distances some of these goods travel. So the yeah. economics of commodities, commodities trading, let alone the trade finance, but the physical trading of commodities, the economics of that is shifting because the transport costs are going going up, but the environmental impact is is also being looked at very carefully. So so is it is it still appropriate to ship goods, you know, halfway literally halfway across the world? Uh, is that does that still make sense? Should we be looking at more regional, localized production? That may not be possible with certain commodities. You know, probably not going to grow a lot of grain in a, cold, in a very cold climate or in a very hot climate. You're probably not going to grow coffee in a cold climate. Um, yeah. You're not going to be able to access oil where there is no oil, uh, uh, and and so on. But aside from those very fundamental constraints. Uh, shortening the distance between production and consumption uh, is is a, is a trend, and it's a trend that I suspect will accelerate, which will create the impression that global trade is, if anything, shrinking. But that's not really a true impression. I think it's just changing its shape. Very true. Um, <coughs> anyone has got any questions? The floor is open. If you have any questions. Couldn't see any written question. So I think we are good, John. Thank you so much. It's very inspiring and you know a lot of insights. We can uh, immediately we should jot it down so that we get the guidelines ready for the bankers and uh, traders. Thank you once again, John, for allotting your precious time for us. And we are honored to have you. And thank you. Have a great day. Ed. My pleasure. Thank you very much. And thank uh, you, everyone, for, for, for being there. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much.